Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Sorry to start a little bit late, but thank you for joining us tonight. My name is David Dodick. I'm the chair of the American Brain Foundation, uh, and I'm really glad that you were able to join us tonight for it. tonight's topic, which is research in ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, what's giving us hope. So tonight we'll learn about research in ALS, the progress made in our understanding of the underlying biology of ALS, and how this has led to advances in treatment in recent years, and also provided hope for many patients with ALS and their loved ones. Our foundation, as you know, is committed to sharing valuable resources and increasing the public's awareness of brain disease. And so our webinar events like tonight are opportunities to connect you with various topics of interest and in particular, the experts in those topics around different brain diseases. The American Brain Foundation funds research across the entire spectrum of brain diseases because we know that when you cure one of these diseases and have advances in treatment, you'll have cures for others. So currently we're funding three ALS researchers and we will be granting awards to three more ALS researchers in the coming months. The current focuses of the research we are funding in ALS range from studying genetic factors for ALS to neuroinflammation uh, in ALS in its various forms. In the last five years, the American Brain Foundation has granted over $2 million to ALS research. So it's something that's really important to us and important to everyone. So let's move into our topic of conversation tonight with our special guest and unquestionably one of the world's foremost experts in this disease, Dr. Mira Sokovich. Dr. Sokovich is the director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS. She's the chief of neurology at Mass General. She's the director uh, and Julian Dorn professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. And proud to say she's also um, a fellow and a member of the American Brain Foundation's board of directors. So thank you so much, Dr. Sokovich, for giving us your time tonight, lending us your expertise, and we're all really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, David and Emily and Liam for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be here to talk about where we are on ALS research and um, to remember fondly that the very first uh, grant I received when I was starting this career was from the American Brain Foundation in the AN, and that's that's what helped me launch my career. I'm just gonna share my slides for a minute here. Right, just a moment. Let's see. Um, I gotta I gotta hide myself so I can get to the button. Uh, there we go. Um so I'm gonna um talk for for you know 15 20 minutes just about where we are in treatments for people living with ALS or may amyotrophic lateral sclerosis very excited to say that we have several options and um there's the the day has changed when we used to tell people that we didn't have any treatments but now we have many treatments that can slow down the illness we have many clinical trials and there's so many people really around the world working on ALS um, so I have a few disclosures that I, I just wanted to show here, both grants to my institution as well as personal consulting. Uh, so ALS has a really broad impact. Um, it stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a what we call a neurodegenerative disease, uh, which means that as people get older, uh, there's a, a greater chance of developing this illness. And there's one one or more parts of the brain or the spinal cord uh, where you have loss of the cells or the neurons. ALS is thought to be a rare disease, but um, actually when one looks at the lifetime risk of getting it, it's actually not that uncommon. Um, so one in 340 women will um, develop ALS uh, in their lifetime. At any one time, there's about 30,000 people in the United States living with ALS and more than 400K a thousand uh, globally. It can hit people it, really at any age. The median age is in the 50s. However, we um, unfortunately, we see people in their teenage years. We see people in their 90s. It really can affect all ages. There's lots of research to try to figure out what causes ALS. We know that 
between 10 and 20% of people have a known change in their DNA, what we call genetic mutation that causes the illness. It runs in their family where many, many people in the same family uh, will have uh, ALS or a related illness called frontal temporal dementia. But for the 80 to 85% of people who don't carry known genetic mutation, we think it's a combination of genetic, what we call genetic risk factors. These are things that increase your risk that are in your DNA of getting an illness, plus things in the environment. And um, as I mentioned, it gets more common as people age. So a couple of years ago, if I was giving this talk, I'd probably say that there was one medicine, Rilazole, that was developed in 1995. It may be one if, if any, uh, clinical trials for people to participate in. That is completely changed right now, which is so exciting. Um, there are more than um, 27 late-stage clinical trials. Those are trials where, um, if they're positive, they could go on to uh, marketing and be available uh, for patients. We're seeing more of these uh, trials uh, have positive results. We have four marketed drugs that slow down the illness. Um, uh, we call them the three R's, Rilazole, Radicava, and Rolibrio are all medicines uh, for all forms of ALS, whether you carry a, ge a genetic mutation that causes it, or you have the um, what we call the sporadic form. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But, but as you can see here, some of them have been available really just recently with the last one, Relivrio, approved by the U.S. FDA and Health Canada in September of 2022. So it's only recently that we can uh, tell our patients when we see them that we have three drugs that we can give them to slow down uh, their illness. Ultimately, we want to be able to say we have treatments that stop their illness. And that's where the research is so important and attracting young, new investigators to the field like the American Brain Foundation does is so critical. More recently, last year, a gene therapy, the first gene therapy for ALS was um, approved by the FDA and is on the market. I'll, tell, I'll show you some of that data, but this is a game changer in the field. Um, the drug is called Tofersen, and this is the first time in my career where I've seen uh, a drug not only work, but actually halt the illness and with some people getting better. And that tells us it's possible. It's possible to um, cure this illness uh, the more you understand the cause of the illness. And that's why research is so important. ALS is um, a field where people are very, very engaged. There's a global um, patient advocacy group that is just phenomenal, that is working to um, help get um, federal funding for ALS, to help each other, to provide things that people um, and families with ALS need, and to work closely with the clinicians and the scientists. There's more than 300 companies working in the ALS space right now, and that, again, is incredible for an illness uh, like ALS. And there's global um, clinical trial networks of investigators and sites working together to try to make sure that uh, no one living with ALS has to travel very far to be part of a uh, clinical trial or ALS research. We're also uh, trying many uh, different innovations to screen through these drugs faster because we know for someone living with ALS, time is really critical. So in 1995, um, uh, in uh, the Northeast, we, we started to work together thinking, you know, we know uh, we know a little bit about ALS. How can we start to bring uh, treatments to people and develop them? And this group uh, called Niels is now over 150 centers all over North America, South America, and uh, also in the Middle East and Europe that work together to bring trials to people with ALS. Anyone who's uh, touched by ALS can be part of this group, and uh, we're grateful for the support of many foundations. So I want to tell you about two of the most recent um, treatments and then tell you about how we're reimagining how to test drugs in, in ALS um, to do it faster. And the approach we're going to talk about uh, can be applied for Parkinson's, for Alzheimer's, for other neurodegenerative diseases and other brain diseases. So AMX035 is also known as Relivrio. This is a drug that was approved in September 2022. And this is a combination of two old drugs. Um, so the, the um, 
investigators and the company that were developing this thought, Ayla, such such a complex illness, there's so many things going on, maybe one medicine isn't enough, and you have to combine uh, more than one medicine that targets different parts of the problem. And so they combined two, um, one called uh, sodium phenobutrate that works on a part of the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum. And the idea is this drug helps with what we call protein homeostasis, meaning it helps make sure that proteins are made correctly and go to the right place in the cell. The other drug um, is called, uh, it has a terrible name, I call it Tutka, um, but it works on something called mitochondria, which are the energy producing parts of the cell. And we know in people with ALS, there's problems with both the mitochondria as well as um, what we call ER, antiplasmic reticulum. And, and so these drugs together, in the lab were better than either one alone, and they were actually better than just adding them together. They were synergistic, and that is why we decided to test it in people together. So this small company uh, came to our consortium, our Niels consortium, and asked for uh, if we could work with them to design a clinical trial and try to um, uh, get this tested as fast as possible. So we worked with them. Um, we included advocacy groups. We um, included people living with ALS, and we designed a trial at 25 centers throughout the United States. And um, the exciting thing is the drug was safe, um, and it had a positive result. So the uh, combination of these two drugs slowed the loss of function by 25% and also had an effect on longevity. And this trial, um, this single trial, um, was all that was needed to get FDA approval in the United States and Health Canada approval um, in Canada. And this was a, um, a shift also for the um, our regulatory group, um, group called the FDA, where typically they, uh, for ALS, wanted two studies to show that uh, drug worked before it could be on the market. And again, thanks to the results of this trial and advocacy and the seriousness of ALS, uh, this um, was approved on one study. Now, um, while it was approved in the U.S. and Europe, our, um, our colleagues in Europe, the health regulatory group in Europe, they wanted a different study, another study. And so it's not approved in Europe right now, but there is a second study ongoing. It's called the Phoenix study. So it's the same medication. It's much bigger than the one we did in the United States. It's 600 participants. It's longer. It's 48 weeks, um, whereas the first one was 24 weeks. And it's including a slightly broader group of participants. So this is an important confirmatory uh, study. Uh, the results are expected in the spring of 2024, so very close. And so what's exciting to me is that we have a drug that slows the progression. We have a major shift in what I call regulatory science with the FDA approving a drug uh, based on one study for a serious fatal illness like ALS. And within a year and a half of that approval, we're going to have results of the confirmatory phase three trial done largely in uh, Europe. So that's one of the new drugs that we can offer our, our the people that we see in our clinic today. Um, I also want to share some of the results from that gene therapy trial I, I uh, pointed out because this is really groundbreaking for ALS for a number of reasons. And you know, when I was a fellow in 1994, actually the first person I took care of was Susan, whose picture is here. And she um, came from a family who had ALS in the family. And then they had the uh, mutation in the first gene that was discovered in ALS, SOD1. And she taught me a lot. She was a teacher. She taught me a lot about how to be a physician um, and the importance of trial and hope and working together as a as a really a, a, a community to solve this illness. And it was so, it's so exciting to me the day that the results of this first gene therapy for the form of the illness she had, had positive results. And so that I could call her son, who was eight years old when she was ill, to tell him that we now have a treatment for the form of ALS that his mother had. So this is a gene therapy. So what does that mean? Uh, this is um, a, a treatment that can block the um, mutation in the gene from making the mis, uh, misfolded or mismade protein called SOD1. And we know from animal and lab studies that if you can block the, the bad um, SOD1 protein from being made from the gene mutation, that that can um, have a dramatic effect on the disease course. Uh, so we tested this in people uh, with SOD1 ALS. This was a global study and it was a positive study. Um, and it was positive in many ways. It slowed um, 
for everybody, the loss of function and breathing and strength. But 40% of the people in this study, they got better. They got improvement in their strength. Now, of course, we have to understand why the other 60%, um, while they slowed the progression, didn't have that improvement. But this is a huge step forward for ALS. We also saw a change in something called a biomarker. Um, so this is a blood test that measures damage to the um, to the nerves. And we saw in the study that at 12 weeks of treatment, um, this marker of neurodegeneration, neurofilament, was lowered by 50%. And that change in that marker predicted clinical response. Again, this is a game changer for ALS because that means that there can be possibly a shorter way to screen drugs to, um, uh, using this blood test rather than perhaps needing longer studies looking at clinical outcomes. And in fact, the FDA approved this drug on what they call an accelerated pathway, meaning they approved it based on the effect on the neuro on the blood biomarker, knowing that that predicted clinical response. So this drug was approved last April. Clinics opened immediately to provide it to uh, people with this form of, of ALS. And in addition, uh, launched the first prevention trial in ALS um, using this treatment in a trial for people who are carriers of the G mutation, but not clinically ill. So a lot of excitement. Um, and of course, there's many more gene therapies that are underway for the other G mutations that can cause the familial form of ALS. So that's for the familiar form. Now, I told you that about 85% of people don't carry known gene. And there are many, many trials for people um, with what we call sporadic ALS. And this slide is just a snapshot of all the activity that's going on. I put in red here um, three trials um, whose results were actually expecting in February of 2024. So very, very soon. I'm sorry I don't have them today to share with you. But these are three late stage um, treatment uh, trials um, whose results we're going to have soon. Um, the first one there is by Sanofi and it blocks inflammation and helps uh, prevent cell death. The second one is by Celos and that also helps uh, clear these um, aggregated proteins that we see in people with ALS. And the third one, Tutka, is a, anti, is a drug that works just on the um, mitochondria. So that's just a snapshot of a few things coming up. But all the other ones listed here are actively enrolling participants um, with the results expected again later this year or early next year. So when we looked at this big list, we thought, okay, if we test each drug one at a time, we're going to be here like 20 years from now. We need to do uh, this more efficiently. And we really borrowed a concept that's already been very successful in cancer uh, clinical trials uh, where they have a lot of drugs and that's called a platform trial. This is a way to really cut down the time um, of drug development by in half, cut the costs and really increase the number of people getting active drug. So just for example, the traditional way of testing a drug to see if it works or not is to test one drug at a time. It's kind of like as if you built a stadium to play a football game and you built the stadium, you played one game and then you took the whole thing down. No one would do that. It's terribly inefficient, but that's how traditional trials were done. What a platform trial does is, is test uh, multiple drugs in the same infrastructure and keep adding, removing drugs until you find the, the cures. And, um, again, it's kind of like building a stadium and playing all, all the matches in there until you, you have your, your final result. So we decided to launch the first platform trial in ALS. We felt that there were enough drugs out there um, that it made sense to do that. And in fact, it, uh, it's hard to imagine uh, doing it any other way now. Um, so to launch this, we first learned from our uh, friends in, in cancer research. We wanted to know what worked for them and what didn't work when they did the platform trials. We brought in people living with the illness to get their uh, thoughts on the design and the and the trial. We talked to the FDA several times. Uh, they were very excited to try to help us design this. And we talked to the foundations and the pharma partners. And um, and then we were able to, to launch it in 2020. Um so what does it look like for someone coming into the trial? Let's say you're going to enroll in this trial. Um, you come in and there's four drugs um, being tested. And we call the drugs regimen. So regimen A, B, C, or D. Um, the participant gets randomized or assigned by random to one of those four drugs. 
So very important that they're all very uh, exciting drugs with good mechanisms of action. So people don't get to choose which one. And so that's a little different from the single trial. But again, if you pick good uh, drugs, um, that, that's really important. Then there's a second randomization where people um, either are assigned to receive the active study medications or a matching placebo. And what's important here is that the um, you can set this up in different ways, but we set it up so that 75% of people got the active drug and 25% placebo. But at the end of the study, that we could pull all that um, data from the people who got placebo and share it with all four of the regimens. That's where you get the efficiency here and that uh, in platform trials. And that's also where you can increase um, for, for people with this illness, um, the chance that they're on active drug during this part of the trial. And then for each of these arms, after six months, people could have uh, the option to go on the active treatment until we have the results of the trial. We took a, um, a broad group of participants, um, and these are just some of the criteria. And very important in the platform trial that each of the drugs, the regimens have the same criteria so that you can compare and um, share the, the data from the placebo group. So we launched this in 2020, um, right in the middle of the pandemic, but we um, we pivoted like many people did and um, really felt it was important for an illness like ALS that we keep the trials going. We have finished the first four drugs here called A, B, C, D. Uh, of those four, two of them have had positive results on going forward to late stage testing, and that's um, regimen C and D. Um, and the first two were negative. So that's also important to know. And they were they were stopped. The fifth drug uh, by uh, Silos, um, results are expected soon. And the sixth and seventh drug are actively enrolling. And so again, the, the efficiency here is that we can share the data uh, between these uh, regimens of the group on placebo. So we can um, uh, have fewer people in the trial, faster enrollment and faster results. So um, this really did work because in the past, uh, in one year, in two years, you would have results maybe of one study. Here in about a year and a half, we had results from the first four, and now we have three more going, and we're talking right now to three more companies to add them uh, later in 2024. So um, much more to say about that. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I I hope I've shown you that this is an incredible time in ALS therapeutics. And to be honest, not just ALS therapeutics, it's all of neurology. I mean, the things that we learn in ALS are being applied in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, the, For example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and uh, some of the Parkinson's um, researchers came to visit us to learn about platform trials, and they are now launching a platform trial in Parkinson's. Same for stroke, same for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we're also sharing... Um, a lot of the science because some of the biologies are overlapping between these diseases. We have a huge pipeline in ALS and it keeps growing. Um, and that means we have to keep getting more innovative of how we can screen rapidly um, and pick the best treatments to go forward for the patients. Um, we, we have good dialogues with our US FDA and they have shown now multiple times regulatory flexibility and understanding about the series of the illness and the willingness to engage with people living with the illness and the ALS community uh, to help find the best treatments for people. We have an amazing community of patients and families, uh, and they have done so much and so much advocacy. In fact, their advocacy has led to um, a bill signed by Biden and approved by both Congress and the Senate called Act for ALS, which uh, provides $100 million a year for ALS research for five years. Um, and that couldn't be done without uh, the patient advocacy and the partnership with uh, the, the hospitals and the foundations. Our long-term goal um, is not just to slow down the illness. We want to slow down the illness, but we want to stop it. We want people to get better. We know now that that's actually feasible. The more you understand about the cause and the closer you get to the root cause, and then we want to prevent it. And so exciting that we actually have our first prevention trial going on right now for people living who carry uh, mutations in SOD1. We have a lot of consortium that work together. Uh, we are um, holding a um, meeting this spring um, with uh, uh, all the experts of trial design in NEALS and uh, with uh, companies that are entering the space so that we can share our knowledge and people don't have to repeat 
or make any uh, any mistakes uh, that were made perhaps before um, so that we can keep learning. And this this is what this community is about. It's about working together um, and, and um, uh, going fast so that we can find things for people with LS. With that, I just want to say I, nothing I do is alone. We have this amazing consortium, uh, a lot of foundations that support um, us and each other. Um, and um, of course, I would partner with the companies that have some of the drugs that you want to test. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope you have a lot of good questions. Eric, that was superb. And I have, I have to say quite honestly, I had no idea that you showed 24 different juggable targets. I had no idea that we were at that level right now uh, in ALS research. So that's phenomenal. For those of you who want to ask questions, you can raise your hand, open your mic, or, or text, put it in the chat, your question. And we have a question here, uh, Mary, and that is, what do you look for in a candidate therapy for a platform design trial? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So uh, um, this our particular platform trial is what we call a phase two trial. So we we are um, looking for drugs that have a good um, target so that the, the mechanism of action of the drug is on a target that we know is important in ALS. That's number one. It has to have a good rationale. Number two is we want to know that it's been tested in preclinical, what we call preclinical models of the disease. And that can be like cell lines or animal models um, so that we know that it actually works in models of the disease. And we want to know that they know the dose to give to people. Those are kind of our, our three requirements. Um, because one, one of the things I learned learning about trial design is it's, it's all about dose. You have to make sure that you know that you're hitting the target um, before you go into people because that will give you the best chance for success. Excellent. So I'm really fascinated by the prevention trial. Of course, to do a prevention trial, one has to know that they have the mutation. Okay. And uh, I know that the first preventive genomics a clinic in the world actually was started there at Harvard, which is where you are. And so my question is, what is the role of preventive genomics, whole genome sequencing in knowing whether or not you have the mutation? Because by the time you start to develop symptoms of the disease, a lot of neurodegeneration has already occurred. So obviously identifying that one has the mutation to be able to engage in one of these preventive trials would be very important. What's your thoughts about that? You know, I think I think the um, the cost of doing whole genome sequencing has really come down a lot, and the technology is there to to know this, and we have to do it obviously careful with how to how to um, share information with people. But for for the the actual prevention trial we're doing, where we we know we have a treatment that works in symptom in people with symptoms, here um, we we spend time telling patients about um, how, you know, why we think it's important to know if you carry it or not, because we think that giving this treatment early might prevent it from starting. We know already from a couple of the marketed drugs for ALS that the earlier you start it when you have symptoms, the bigger effect you have. And so we are taking this leap that if you actually even take some of these drugs before your symptoms, that we really could prevent it. So I do think that it's really important, but it's it's a um, a dialogue and one that can't be rushed with people because it's obviously a big deal for someone to find out whether they carry a, a gene mutation or not. Right, right. You know, tofersen, um, as you mentioned, actually decreases the level of neurofilament light, NFL, and that predicts outcome. Um, so I guess my question is, AMX0035 that you talked about, that is a combination drug. Um, it seemed to slow um, the decline in function in 25% of people. Did it affect neurofilament light levels? Yeah. Very good question. So, so Amelix, or the, also known as Relivrio, did not change neurofilament lo levels in blood in the six month study. So, the field, um, there's a couple of things that we don't know. So, we know that if, if you lower it, it's just a good thing <laughs> and it can predict good clinical response. If it goes up, we know that's bad. But if it doesn't change and you see still a clinical effect, it just tells us that it's not the only biomarker we need. And it might be that for drugs that perhaps are not right at the absolute root cause and are a little further away from the root cause, maybe those, maybe it's not going to change their fulfillment or it's going to take longer. And so we're we're waiting to hear you know the results of the repeat study of 
the Amlex drug because it's it's longer. And so maybe we'll we'll see that it's just going to take a little longer. But but it's it's still an open question in the field. Yeah, thank you. There's a question here. How does the challenge of heterogeneity in ALS compare to other diseases? And how's the field accounting for this in trial design? Yeah, really good question. And, and I think this this um, question plagues many brain dis- brain <laughs> diseases, um, you know, it's particularly neurodegenerative diseases, where we know clinically that people are very different. They have very different courses. We know in ALS that some people have a course that's so rapid, it's less than a year, and other people uh, have a course of 10 years plus. So um, we do have to solve this. And I I have hope that with AI and a lot of the omics work that are going on, that we might be able to subset people by biology better. But right now, the way we deal with it in trials is with our inclusion criteria to try to get a more homogeneous group and with, you know, the sample size where we still need a couple of hundred people uh, to deal with that heterogeneity. But as we get smarter or have the tools uh, biologically to understand the subsets, well, I think the trials will get better. Yeah. Another question here is, can you talk about DIALS? Yeah, DIALS stands for Dominantly Inherited uh, ALS. Um, and this this is a study modeled after um, something called Diane in Alzheimer's disease, Dominantly Inherited Al- Alzheimer's disease, where Uh, we're following people at high risk for getting ALS, so people who are gene carriers. And and we're following them pre-symptomatically with um, lots of measures, cognitive measures, um, electrophysiology, blood, spinal fluid markers, to try to understand what are the first signs that happen um, and to help us then have that data to design prevention trials. So in DIALS, we, you know, there there are many different gene mutations that can cause ALS. There's actually over 45. Um, and so um, it's really anyone with a family history can come in. And there people can choose to find out if they carry the gene or not. And if they don't want to know, that's fine. And they stay in the study. And, and um, But if they want to know, they can also find out. So there's a lot of genetic counseling as well. Yeah. So first in this very exciting um, treatment, not only slowed the in the decline in function, but it also actually improved strength. People actually had reversal of function, improvement of function. Yeah. Um, so are you seeing that with, you know, AMX0035 as well, or did you just see, a di- you know, a slowing of progression? Um, we just, with AMX035, we just saw slowing. Yeah. Um, really, the, the first time um, the field has seen improvement is with the um, gene therapy for SOD1. And the excitement is that there's a another study, another gene, FUS, which which our uh, FUS, which can happen in in young young people. Um, Neil Schneider, Columbia has done some studies, and there are some people getting better there as well. So again, the kind of this theme that if if we're on the cause of the illness, it's possible to get better. And again, it tells us the motor neurons are are there, you know, and they're maybe they're dysfunctional, and you can they can still repair. Um, and, and it's really changed the language in the field that now we're thinking about repair and regeneration and rehab. Um, and this is all just the last year. Amazing. Question here, are there any prevention trials for C9 or F72 mutation? And maybe you can tell us, tell us all what that mutation. Yeah. 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 So, um, there aren't yet, but we, about dials is, is setting up you know, gathering the information so we can um, do that. So C9 or 72 is actually the most common uh, genetic mutation causing ALS. And it it's, it doesn't only cause ALS. In some people, it also causes frontal temporal dementia. It's um, a triplet repeat disease. And so th- what that means is that there's a part of the gene that um, the code for the, the genetic code repeats many, many times. And it's turning out in, in neurology, not just ALS, but also in Huntington's and other uh, diseases where, where we have those triplet repeats, that the gene therapies are more complicated. And so the, um, the, uh, the, there have been two attempts at gene therapies for C9 or F72 that did not work. But I just feel it's like step one, like the, you know, the first first stem bone marrow transplants for, for cancer didn't work either, but people didn't give up. Um, it means that we had to get smarter and talk across fields to try to understand why it didn't work in ALS, why didn't it work in Huntington's? Um, can we uh, figure out how to tackle these, uh, what I call triplet uh, repeat disorders? Yeah. 
You know, tofersin is one of these antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs, and it's a very exciting area, obviously. And but you know, tofersin needs to be administered intrathecally, right around the spinal cord. So it requires a lumbar puncture because they don't get easily, these drugs don't get easily past the blood brain barrier. But there are ways to open the blood brain barrier. So is there any work being done with some of these ASOs where one opens the blood brain barrier to see if there's penetration and clinical effect? Yeah, it's such a good good question. Yeah, you're absolutely right that people have to come in once a month for an injection of the uh, gene therapy uh, in their spinal fluid. Um, so yeah, yes, people are trying to do this. And um, I know there was a 60 Minutes recently on focused ultrasound for uh, Alzheimer's for to open the blood-brain mirror. And there are several groups now um, uh, looking at that for gene therapy uh, approaches in, in ALS. It's still early days, yeah. um, but I, I think... Um, you know, that's the next innovation now that, now that we have some uh, su success. Yeah. In, uh, in this platform trials, Merritt, how long are each of the placebo control phases before one gets to, so how long do they take? Yeah. So we, we designed it to be six months because we wanted it to, to be um, kind of a rapid, ra relatively rapid screen. You, it's hard to go much sh uh, shorter than six months with this illness. And then after the six month double blind or the randomized part, people can go into the uh, long-term open extension where they a hundred percent get the, get the drug. Yeah. It seems to me that six months, uh, 48 weeks, these longer trials, that's precious time that patients are losing when they're randomized to placebo. Yeah. So I hope, do you think there's a day in the future when if neurofilament light responds rapidly, and so that's a question, how rapidly can neurofilament light respond? But if you have a drug that rapidly drops neurofilament light level, um, one would think that a placebo controlled trial might not be necessary for that type of therapy where you know you're having an effect on the underlying biology of neurodegeneration. Yes, you're absolutely right, David. That that is where the hope and the field's going. Um and cer certainly in the phase two space. I mean, and maybe even in the later phase three space. Um, there are colleagues in Europe are actually starting the, their version of a platform trial called Expert ALS, which is only looking at neurofilament. And they're just gonna screen. And there is, they're really just picking the best drug, the drug that lowers neurofilament the most, that will then go into a traditional phase three. And for that type of approach, you don't, I don't think you need a placebo. The other question is really about AI. You know, can you use, um, can you make these kind of digital twins or the, um, do we have enough data on, on the natural history that you could, um, you know, kind of match people that way again in that phase two space? Terrific. Um, there's a question here. Can you explain again the combined placebo group, the placebo groups from each segment um, are compared with each other. Sure. Yeah. So in the traditional trial, um, you know, half the people are on the drug and half on placebo. And then the end of the study, you do your comparison. In the platform trial, it's a, a sh for each drug, it's a, sh a smaller percent. Um, for us, it was 25% for each drug. But the end of the study, you, you pull all the data from each of those 25% in each of the drugs. Uh, drug arms, each of the regimens, and you use all that data. So you actually can compare one to one still, or it actually can be, you know, one to 1.2. You know, you can keep using, as long as the natural history doesn't change, you can keep using that placebo data uh, for all your arms. Um, and so it, it, it really, it, it, for patients, it's, it, it's still not good to have a placebo, but instead of a 50% chance, it's a 25%. And we hope maybe over time that it can be even less. Excellent. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Sakovich? Well, that was superb. Thank you again, uh, Merritt. That was just excellent. And before we end tonight, I just want to thank you all again for joining us. As you know, we host these free webinars regularly. We'd love to see you again. The next one's February 26th with Drs. Alex Porter and Greg Casino on seizures, what you need to know. And you can also follow us on social media to stay up to date on brain disease information. We also invite you to visit Brain and Life website and listen to the Brain and Life podcast. Brain and Life is the official publication of our partner organization, the American Academy of Neurology. So there's lots of information there and resources to help you keep your brain healthy. And of course, you can also support 
innovative research to find cures for to, to, tomorrow's cures by making a donation to the American Brain Foundation, which I know uh, many of you already have, and no donation is too small. Um, you can see the kind of research. As I said, we funded ALS researchers, young investigators to the tune of over $2 million. So it's desperately needed. And so we, uh, we couldn't do this without your support. So thank you all very much. Have a great night. And Merritt, thank you once again for taking the time tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Nice to see everybody. Bye-bye.